Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. If you are new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers, just me and them either indoors or outdoors or not at all. So if they sound like your growing conditions, hit subscribe. I post once a week, every Friday, and I'm a complete amateur, and these are just the things that have worked for me with the type of orchids I'm growing, which brings us, <gasps> ladies and gentlemen, plant lovers, look at that. I made a video four months ago about Holcoglossum, and I had King Balianum in bloom, and it was a miracle to me. It was so beautiful and sensational. I'll put the link up there for you. And below. And because it's a cold grower and it just lives very happily outside, I kind of became somewhat obsessed with Holker Glossoms, went on a bit of a binge, bought more, which included this one, and I made a video about buying it <laughs> uh, four months ago. Now, this particular one, and I'll tell you the name so we're out of our suspense, it actually doesn't have a name because it's a cross, it's an intergeneric cross between Holcoglossum subulifolium and Vanda corolescens, as you can see there. Now, when it arrived, one of the leaves had been damaged and the plant just didn't look super healthy and fabulous. And I was a little concerned. So unlike all the other Holcoglossums that I have, I decided not to put this one outside as it arrived in midwinter here in Australia, four months ago in June. I decided to keep it indoors. And in fact, I'm gonna show you exactly where I put it. I thought, you know what? With that Vanda ancestry, we need somewhere bright and warm, particularly through winter. So I put it underneath um, a Chinese lacquer desk out on the landing. And if you've seen my grow space video, you'll know exactly where I mean. So north facing, and as I'm in the Southern hemisphere, that's the brightest spot. Obviously in the Northern hemisphere, you would want south facing, but here it's north facing and it gets lots of bright indirect light through winter. And it is much warmer up here on the first floor of the house than it is downstairs. So the perfect spot, I thought, I'm just gonna let it over winter. Then I'm gonna just tackle the repotting. There's lots of dead roots and it doesn't look particularly healthy, but I'm gonna wait till spring because I don't wanna repot it in a colder time of year. Anyway, plant lovers, what should happen? But it sends out a flower spike. <gasps> so I think what we need to go through is the history of the two parents, what I've been doing and what I'm going to do and a tangled web of a care video for this beautiful orchid. All right. Let's start, as Julie Andrews says, at the very beginning with the two parents. Holcoglossum subulifolium. Now that is a beautiful white flowering Holcoglossum, so have a Google of that. And that is described as a cold to cool grower, even though its range is Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and then across to Hainan, which is the, the well, it's tropical, subtropical island, which is the southernmost part of China. But, at high elevations. So high elevations obviously generally mean cooler, particularly winter nighttime minimums. The Holcoglossum subulifolium can grow up to 2,200 meters. So that is quite high and that is quite cool. So it gets cold nighttime temperatures in winter. And it has a very classic Holcoglossum flower and it's white. And the Holcoglossum subulifolium flowers in spring and I could only find one picture of it sort of growing in its native habitat. It's an epiphyte, as, as you can see from, from this one. But you know, there's epiphytes and there's epiphytes. This is, well, the Holcoglossum type is an epiphyte that literally clings. So some epiphytes sort of nestle in moss, in nooks, on trees, or in mounds of detritus, in trunks, and blah, blah, blah. And then there are epiphytes that just cling, so they kind of have no matter around them. They're getting all their moisture from the bark of the tree or airborne moisture because it's humid and cloudy. So it depends on the relative moisture of the environment they're in. This baby is a clinger, which means that its environment is quite moist most of the time. And the picture that I saw of this growing, it was actually quite low on the, the trunk of the tree, almost where it starts to, to um, branch out that's the word, into its root system. So quite near the ground, and there it was. So reasonably dappled light, but not bright dappled light. So that's quite um, almost an understory plant. Anyway, interesting to see where it grows. So somewhere moist, somewhere humid, somewhere where there is relatively regular rainfall, but not super bright light. 
And subulifolium, I discovered, I had to text my friend Stephen Ryan that I have another channel with called The Horticulturalists, and he is the king of botanic Latin names. I asked Stephen, what does subulifolium mean? And it means leaf tapering to a point. So let's go to parent number two. Vanda coralescence. Now that is the one that has a, well, people call it blue, but it's really, I think it's violet, a violety blue flower, quite famous because of the color of the flower. Now, interestingly enough too, it comes from very similar distribution, but a bit further either way. So a bit broader, it stretches off into the Himalayas and across, but the difference is that that orchid grows to a lower elevation. So subulifolium, Holcoglossum subulifolium grows up to 2,200 meters. Van der Coralescens grows up to 1,200 meters. So that is quite a significant difference, which means that it is a cool to hot grower. So it doesn't quite have those temperature extremes that its Holcoglossum cousin does further up the mountain, but it grows in a similar manner. So it's a clinger. It doesn't have much matter around it. It's clinging to the bark and it's getting all of its nutrient and moisture from the bark of the tree and from anything airborne around it. So again, we can safely assume it's a similar bandwidth of territory that it's getting similar kind of conditions, lots of humidity, cloud cover, airborne moisture, and pretty good rainfall. But because it's running down the bark of the tree, it's not wet. It will absorb what it wants. It will evaporate quickly, rinse and repeat. And the Vanda flowers at similar sort of time, late winter, early spring. And what I have noticed, which is kind of unusual with that particular van der Coralescens, is it's a, it's a smaller flower, it's a smaller plant, and it will flower at a much smaller size. Because most, you know, the vandas that you imagine, those huge, showy, tropical looking ones, the plant needs to be quite mature before that's going to flower for you, but not van der Coralescens. So all of that plant lovers, if we put it in a blender, ping, this is what we get. So the flower, the shape is very much the shape of the Holcoglossum ancestor, but the color is very much from the Vanda ancestor. And you have this perfect degradé, I suppose, of purple going through to white. And in fact, the coralescence bit is such an interesting um, Latin translation because in Latin, cerulius means blue, sky blue, and the essence suffix means becoming. So perhaps, well, in fact, what it means is I would say that van der Coralescens, the color gets deeper as it ages. Oh my goodness, don't you love it when there are clues in the name? Anyway, I've just made that up. It might not be true, but if you grow van der Coralescens and the flower does get darker as it ages, you could tell us below. And van der itself is an interesting word. I didn't realize that it comes from Sanskrit because vandas occur in India, Sri Lanka, but across Southeast Asia, but they were first encountered by Europeans in India, Sri Lanka, and the Sanskrit word was anglicized to create the name Vanda. Hmm, and I'm, it's not particularly common, I don't think, in taxonomy that sort of non-Latin Greek words are incorporated into the name of the plant, so there you go. Who knew? Now we do that Vanda is from a Sanskrit word for one of the species that was growing, I think, in India or Sri Lanka at the time. So the growing conditions for the Vanda are pretty similar. It's growing in a similar spot, clinging to the side of trees. It's getting brightish dappled light. Putting that in a blender, in terms of the care, I was just a bit concerned that it was gonna to be too cold outdoors. So I've kept it indoors all winter. And look what happened. As I said, not a particularly healthy specimen, I didn't think, but it sent out this flower spike. And it is now spring in Australia and ta-da. Both its species parents can flower in spring, so this is correct. And they are described as fragrant and plant lovers. It has the most delicate, beautiful fragrance. And, and it's not that delicate because when you walk past, you can smell it. And um, it is a really citrusy fragrance, not as, not as in the fruit, but as in orange blossom, lemon blossom. It has that beautiful, tangy citrusness to it. Oh, I could smell it forever. But more than that, the flower color is just stunning. Anyway, I was really quite surprised that it bloomed and thrilled. So let me tell you the care that I've been giving it. Essentially, it's getting bright, indirect light because it's indoors. Now, all of this type of orchid, the Holcoglossums, the Vandas, the Renanthras, all of that type, because they're clingers, uh, need 
quite a lot of moisture because they are not in media which they can draw moisture from. They're drawing moisture in the wild from the bark of the tree and from airborne sources, humidity, clouds, etc. So growing them not mounted like this means that you kind of got to drench the pot relatively regularly to really make sure all the roots are getting wet. So that's one thing that I do. Water it far more frequently than other orchids. Obviously less in winter, more in summer, but I don't let it sit in water. So I literally pour it in, let it wash out, drain out, and then sit it back in its saucer. And I am, was, will <laughs> repot this uh, because the roots aren't particularly healthy. I mean, a lot of them, as you can see, have desiccated and died. I don't love plastic, as you know. So what I am going to do is get crafty with my drill and drill myself a small terracotta pot and drill some holes in it to create um, a vanda pot, basically. So that's what I'm going to do. But obviously, I'm not going to do that until the flower spike has died. I'm still not convinced this plant is super healthy, though. Um, although it's flowered, but sometimes plants can flower when they're about to die. It's that last hurrah to try and get seeds out into the world because I cannot see a growing tip in there. And what I fear I can see is a little brown tip, which means there may have been a growth which has for some reason uh, rotted, but you can't see any trace of rot there. The plant is basically the same as when I bought it, except it's burst into bloom. So not gonna give up. I'm gonna let it do its thing, let the flower spike die off, and then I'm gonna repot it and see what happens. Now, the other thing with such orchids, so with Vandas, with Holcoglossum, with Renanthera, again, because they are not really in medium, they're a clinger. And in the wild, they get their nutrients sort of accidentally, I suppose. Growing them in cultivation means you do need to fertilize them quite often. And I think more than perhaps any other orchid. So I use a liquid fertilizer and a liquid tonic, not at the same time, but you could. And I try at least every sort of three waterings to use one of those sorts of nutrients. And again, let it water it from the top, let it wash through, let it drain before you put it back in its saucer, if it is in a saucer, so that the roots aren't sitting in any water. Again, dialing down the fertilizing in winter, but some of the renantheras and holcoglossums can grow throughout the year. So you still maybe want to use a little bit, but not so much. And um, in winter, I tend to use more tonics, which are things like worm juice or a seaweed based liquid solution. And I dial all those down to about one sixth, one eighth, one tenth of the recommended dose. And that's more of a tonic than necessarily food. Liquid feed, again, I always dial it right down to one sixth, one eighth, one tenth of the recommended dose so that it's not too much. Other than that, humidity, obviously, I give these a spray, but I give them a spray as often as I give everything else a spray, which is generally once a day in the morning when I'm wandering past with a cup of tea. So indoors doesn't seem to be affected negatively by our household average humidity, whatever that might be, but our house isn't overheated, so it's not particularly dry indoors and outdoors. The average humidity in Melbourne is relatively moderate to medium, I would say. In a nutshell then, pretty low maintenance, just the odd mist every morning. And look, I also miss the roots to make sure that there's moisture around there. So that's it really. I'm just so thrilled with the flower because it's the most beautiful, elegant thing. I'm as thrilled and excited as I was when the Holcoglossum Kimbalianum bloomed for me. This is just a stunner. It is the most glorious color, the combination of those two. So of course, my little fingers went to searching and I was looking for other cold climate or cold growing vandas because I'm kind of just feeling I need to experiment a bit more. And I found, and I've had to write them down because I can't remember, I found a list online and I think it was an American um, chat site where people were talking about growing vandas cold. Now, growing vandas cold in one place isn't perhaps the same as growing them cold in another. So this is the thing, you've got to experiment in your own region to find out what works. But these are some of the names that were mentioned. Vanda Roblingiana, Vanda Tessellate, Vanda Coalescens, and the Alba version of that, Vanda Denisonia. So those are some sort of smaller, cooler growing Vandas that I'm going to investigate and see if I can find here in Australia and grow them outdoors because super easy. And I just love these blooms. And just in terms of how it's sort of potted at the moment, it's in the basket, obviously, with very large pieces of bark. 
and when I pot mine in my hand drilled pot I will use very large pieces of bark and I will also use pumice stone which just aerates it a little bit and a little bit of sphagnum just to retain a bit of moisture but not too much and very loose and very aerated so literally like this so there's no packing down of the material uh, and it's very loose and there's plenty of space between all those big chunks of bark for the roots to go exploring. So there we are plant lovers, the most beautiful cross between a Vanda and a Holker Glossum, there we go again, which I'm loving with a passion. I hope that the plant is healthier than I feel it is and that it's going to thrive. I can just see a little green bump at the bottom which either could be a new root, but sometimes these types of orchids send up a little sort of puplet from the bottom. Anyway, flowering is a good sign and it seems quite happy living underneath my Chinese lacquer desk on the top landing, getting plenty of bright indirect light, plenty of warmth and a mist every morning and a good drenching with a little bit of food once every three waters. There you go, plant lovers. I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I have and I wish you could smell the fragrance, but just imagine the lightest citrusy orange blossom and that is where this will take you, even though it's purple and not particularly citrusy looking, but that's the fragrance. I hope you like that. Do hit subscribe if you want to follow my continuing amateur adventures. Obviously, these are just the conditions that work for me. Wherever you are, things will be very different depending on your climate and what you can and can't grow. But so far, this is what's working for me. I do post every Friday. And if you like this, do hit the thumbs up button. And I look forward to seeing you next week with another amateur rambling about what I may or may not be doing well in the world of growing cold, cool, intermediate orchids. See you next week.